Hi, everybody. Hi. My name's David. I um, have no slides, no content, and I haven't done this before. So you guys are going to have to work <laughs> with me. I've, I've been told that we can fill up as much time as we want, and it can be fairly interactive. Um, I thought I'd start by, I love to hear who I'm talking to. It, you, if you guys don't mind going around super quick, tell me your name, which company you work for, and one, just like one sentence on what you do. And if you're like the fifth person in that company, you can say, I kind of work with that guy or that gal. And tell me one thing about you. I'm we go Eddie. way back. Yeah. I'm, I'm Eddie from Photo Labs, and we, we have met. Uh, we make cameras, the first stick and shoot camera. And um, something interesting about me. Actually, I, I read your bio, that story I sent out. I noticed the Doobie Brothers uh, reference, and I performed that song with my band in high school, too. So I thought that was awesome. Beautiful. <laughs> Great. I am uh, Brian Gannon, uh, founder of Wink Labs, and we're making a smart picture frame. Okay. So, uh, interesting thing about me, uh, let's see, third generation longshoreman. Wow. Wow. That's cool. I'm Kaya. I'm uh, with Keyboardio. How do you spell that? Kaya, K-A-I-A. Got it. Kaya. Yeah. Um, and Keyboardio is making beautiful, comfortable, hackable keyboards. Um, trying to reinvent the keyboard from the ground up. That kind of keyboard. That kind of keyboard. Um, and something interesting about me is I play ukulele. Nice. Um, hey, I'm Jesse. Jesse Vincent. I've been ukulele in my office, but I can't really play it very well. Um, it's easy. Um, hey, I'm Jesse Vincent, also from Keyboardio. Um, she told you what we do. Uh, interesting about me. I've done the software startup thing effectively four times. This is my first hardware. Hi, I'm Pamela Jennings. I'm from Constructs, and uh, we're building a smart uh, block set for cognitive training and acuity and baby boomers who want to get sharper and spatial reasoning. Um, I guess, uh, let's see, a unique thing about me, a couple of years ago I got a chance to sing in Verity's Requiem and it was the best. Wow. Good job. <laughs> um, my name is Matt. I'm with Six Sense Technologies. We're doing uh, intelligent test, test tools for uh, better workflows. And an interesting thing about me, I've... Uh, <laughs> Let's see. I uh, I've been to almost every continent now. South America, I have to do still. That's your last one. It's my well in Antarctica. Does that yeah. really count? My name is Allison Lewis. I'm the founder of Switch Embassy. We make clothing that you can control with a mobile app, and so you can change image, animation, and add text to your clothing on the fly. Um, something interesting about me is, I think there's a lot of interesting things about all of us. Um, let's see. Well, I wrote a book called Switchcraft, Battery Powered Crafts to Make and Sew, and I was on the Martha Stewart show. Nice. Doing stuff awesome. with her. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm John. I'm the Hyman One blog content guy. So I will theoretically be turning this talk into a, a post it's or Nintendo. several posts that will go up on the Highway 1 blog for everybody to refer back to later. Can you uh, make me more interesting? I'd, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, this can easily be done. Flifty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Tree. Uh, founder of SugarCube. We're making a universal receiver that lets you stream from any device, any platform to any TV or projector. What, what else was I supposed to say? <laughs> Something interesting about yourself? Interesting. Um, you got nothing. Yeah. Nothing. All right. You have a red jacket. I, have a, I ride a motorcycle. There you go. Uh, my name is John Fitzpatrick. I work with Eddie over there uh, at Poto. I'm laying out a printed circuit board right now. And this weekend I made low pot jam. And last weekend I made low pot wine. Yeah. Should be ready pretty soon. If it <laughs> yes. <laughs> and today is his first day as a full timer. Uh, yeah. 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 number one. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Joachim Westen. We're a uh, team from Sweden. We're making small shortcut buttons that looks like this. And it uh, works. <laughs> um, uh, an interesting thing about me, I can build boats. You can build boats, like yeah. big giant boats? or yeah. <laughs> What's the biggest boat you've built? I haven't built anyone, but I'm educated. <laughs> 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 it's all theoretical. Uh, my name is Amir. Uh, also from Shortcut Labs, also from Sweden. Um, well, we're Swedish. There's nothing interesting 
about it. <laughs> there you go. That's interesting in itself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I am Pedro from Lumo. We are building an interactive uh, projector for kids. Interactive projector for kids? Yep. Got it. And I am really not an interesting okay. person, so <laughs> That's not true. I am Eric of Palette Home. We're building uh, smart appliances to make it easy to cook restaurant quality food at home. Something interesting about me, uh, I worked overseas in Japan for several years and haven't found good sushi here yet. And now what? Haven't found good sushi yet in the Bay Area. Really? Yeah. It's a bold statement. <laughs> yeah. Have what do you, you think the sushi here is pretty average or not good? Or? There's a lot that's tailored to American taste. Uh -huh. And then what I've heard is on the high end, the, the fish isn't as great. I haven't gone to the really high end, so it's going to be the problem. Um, I'm Karen Kashansky, co founder of Send Silk. And Donald uh, walked in, um, he's, he's up there. Um, <laughs> we're, building, we're, we're building smart clothing. Um, our first product is a connected sports bra with a, connecting to a mobile app to monitor heart rate. And um, I'm, an, I'm an ice hockey player and will definitely use my own product. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. I, will, um, I, I was thinking I can, I'll introduce myself back, and then I can give you some of my background. So I, for, for me, the more Q&A we can do, the better, because then I can tailor whatever I can talk about for you guys um, as much as possible. But I'll give you some more context beyond whatever that bio that was sent over was written, and then give you an idea of, of things I've done that may be useful or not useful. Um, my name's David Wu. I have spent pretty much most of my life as an entrepreneur. One interesting fact, let's see. I'm surprisingly good at driving my car in reverse. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> I've always been good at that. Um, my background, I spent my whole life pretty much as an entrepreneur. I um, spent 10 years at a company called Homestead. I joined this company in 1997, um, coming off a career as a musician for a little while, and saw an ad in the paper. It was the only one with a URL in it. This is back in 97. It had a funny name. It was www.cartoffelsoft.com. And I know what the heck that was. I clicked on it and actually got a 404 broken link. But I called in and went in anyways, and it was 18 guys with 128 modem. And um, they were all young, idealistic, brilliant, had no idea what they were doing. and um, I'm like, well, I can kind of be the gray hair guy here because I've been doing product for many years. Before I took a detour and became a musician, I had written many lines of code and I had been a product guy for many years. I'm like, well, I actually understand how to do a product cycle. I you know, understand how to do a staging server. I understand kind of QA. So I'm like, well, I can be the first guy here that knows how to actually build stuff. Everyone else had been bootstrapping along, consulting for other companies. So I joined on board. We actually started off the first product that they were kind of messing around with was called Fundamental. It's actually a programming language for kids, kind of assembly for kids, object-oriented. And the idea was you can kind of have these different objects, and they had different interactions. And right then, the web was just starting to take off a little bit. We had noticed that GeoCities and Tripod and all these web 1.0 site creation tools were starting to take off. And we're like, they're still so hard to use. Why don't we revamp this fundamental programming language and actually cater it to the adults, which are far less technology-driven and actually a much easier channel than going through the education channel and we rebuilt it as an HTML editor, and it became disruptively easier than any other way of building websites. And we kind of grew from no customers to 20 million customers in a couple years. We're adding about 20,000 new customers per day, which especially in the 90s was, was a ton. Um, the dark side of that is we pretty much had no business model, and we had about a million dollar a month um, bandwidth cost just in the pipe. This is the old days when you didn't have the AWS, and you had racks and racks and racks of servers. Um, we started to turn on revenue streams where every time somebody would drop what we called an object, it's kind of like a little widget onto a page, and hit publish, those companies would pay us because we were this great distribution channel. And we were getting a dollar a day per drop, and it was just great up into the right revenue stream with multiple years of visibility. Filed the S1 in 2000 with Mary Meeker on the cover. Um, kind of a funny story. I remember, you know, is, is it frothy again now? But I remember sitting. Um, with our CEO, he had a, li a little too much swagger in those days. And Mary Meeker wanted to pitch us on being the banker for our IPO. And it was during the same time of year, March Madness. And our CEO, Justin, said, well, the second round of the NC2As are that day. We'll only do it if you meet us at Old Pros, which is a sports bar down in Palo Alto. And this is the old, old pros. And we can watch the game while you pitch us. So I have a, I have a vicious memory of 
watching the NCTAs while Mary Meeker showed up with a thousand dollar telescope to pitch us on why we're going to be the, the big IPO of 2000. Within a few months, we realized the only thing going faster than revenue was bad debt because all the companies that were supposedly paying us raised all this money from venture capitalists on Sand Hill, had no businesses of their own. All the checks were bouncing. We pulled the S1. We did layoffs. We did pay cuts. We downsized. We changed to a subscription model and realized the only people that would pay us were small businesses. Went from like 25 million customers to like close to no customers. And we, then we hung on by our fingernails for the ride. And sooner or later, overnight success was a decade in the making. Um, we got rid of a lot of our hired guns and we real, built it back again. By then I kind of graduated from being the product guy and the tech guy to being kind of the jack of all trades guy. Um, at one point I was kind of the, the CFO and the COO and the, the product guy. And we just hung up our fingernails. We did a lot of A-B testing. We did a lot of you know, sales testing. We added the dialer to, to close sales online. Selling to the S&B channel was really, really hard. 10 years after I joined, 2007, we finally got it back to a, about a 25 million dollar business in revenue, sold it to Intuit, had a nice exit, kept growing it inside of Intuit to about a hundred million dollar business, and I ran, I ran a bunch of businesses inside of Intuit, but on the side I just missed consumer. I think that everyone should work at a big company once. Um, how many of you guys have worked at a big company before? How many of you guys is the first time starting a company? And how many of you first time go around at hardware? Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I think everyone should work at a, at a big company once, just like many of you know. I, I, just like everyone, I think, should work at a restaurant once. If you haven't bust tables and you haven't you know, been a waiter, you don't understand what the heck's going on behind, the, behind closed doors. Um, but it definitely wasn't for me. So on the side, I started doing a lot of angel investing. So I got involved early with the band Angels. I was kind of the young guy doing the internet stuff. And then I got involved with Naval and AngelList, kind of two very polar extremes. I often, you know, that's certainly one topic. I have a lot of opinions on who to raise money from and the difference between an angel syndicate and a momentum angel on angel list and a VC and, and those kind of things. So if that's something worth talking about, definitely let me know. Um, got involved in these polar ends of the spectrum. Really, really different things. I actually think it's very rare that I see a startup that should be seeking funds from like an angel syndicate, like Abandoned Angels or a Kiretsu and AngelList because they're so different. But it's not one size fits all. Um, done close to 30 angel investments over the last four or five years and then um, was debating whether to start a company again or to join a company or to do more investing. And I think all this pent up ADD I have in my head from being kind of the inside guy for you know, a couple decades came out bursting and I realized I can actually get a career where I can meet cool new entrepreneurs every half hour of the day and try to catch up. And that's kind of like my favorite thing to do. So I've been a venture capitalist for about a year and a half now. I joined a firm called Mavron that is a very unique venture capitalist firm. I think you know, a lot of, there's a lot of opaqueness to the venture world, and I'd seen it from the entrepreneur side. I think my brain's still wired much more like an entrepreneur, so if there's anything I can tell you guys about the venture industry from somebody that works as a venture capitalist but has spent their life thinking like an entrepreneur, I'm happy to talk about that as well. But one thing I can tell you is one of the things that, that drove me to join Mavron is that we just kind of do everything a little bass backwards, and I love that I mean, as an entrepreneur. I mean, I, and one other thing I would say is that a lot of venture businesses are really different than each other because it's such an obscure kind of job where it's hard to say if you have these skills, you'll be good at it. A lot of it is retroactive, that combination of luck and the strategy being authentic to what they're trying to do. Just like there are a lot of different kinds of startups, I think there's even more different kinds of venture capital funds. I think the biggest difference for us at Maveron is that unlike a lot of big mega funds on Sand Hill Road are, that were built by generations of venture capitalists. Mavron was built by two coffee guys out of Seattle. Dan Levitan, who's the recovering ex-banker that took to Starbucks Public, and Howard Schultz, who's the founder and currently the CEO of um, Starbucks, started the fund in 98. And they had the belief that the next big generation of consumer brands were gonna be fueled by technology but that the technology itself wasn't going to be the differentiator. It was going to be more of an enabling mechanism to build big brands. And so the idea was to build a boutique fund that specialized in finding the best entrepreneurs that know how to build consumer brands. And our whole thesis is to go early and go before it's obvious that the market exists, but go and not be wrong about the entrepreneurs. So kind of core to our thesis is we want to spend tons and tons of time with the entrepreneur. Uh, uh, ideally, we spent six to nine months with the entrepreneur well before we write a, a multi-million dollar check. 
And as of recently, especially because we're getting more aggressive in San Francisco, one of the ways we do that, not the only way, but one of the ways is we've been pretty aggressive in our seed program, where we often write small checks coupled with kind of a high touch approach, which is different. If you had a really, really large fund, it's very hard to give a lot of individual attention. And we try really hard to. And our goal is by the time somebody wants to raise a Series A, that one, we don't need to see the deck. We spend enough time with the entrepreneurs. And two, we don't want to pitch why we're different. We Hopefully, they, the entrepreneurs themselves have seen it. And that's one thing that I definitely believe as an entrepreneur and now as a venture capitalist is that a lot of times the processes that are in place now are much more akin to speed dating or shotgun marriages. And in reality, most exits take a decade in the making. And one of the biggest problems that people have along the way that they don't realize is lack of alignment, kind of core alignment in, in the boardroom or in the shareholders of the company. And that, that's a tricky one to figure out up front. And you know, one thing I always preach is that anybody who wants to go and raise money, especially if you're fortunate enough that you have a lot of options, should, you should do as much um, reference checking on people who are going to give you money as you do on hiring an exec to the team. Because it's easier to fire a bad um, person on the leadership team than to fire somebody that gave you a chunk of money for an equity stake in your company. And a lot of people don't think of it that way. And, and that's sort of different from the seed round to the A round and on, but still, it, it, it's the relationships that you get put in place there from the early days. It's hard enough to build a company if everyone's facing the same way and if you have people that have different objectives. That's actually one of the things I didn't really understand is the circle of life in venture, which is that, you know, as an entrepreneur, I used to think, oh, you go and pitch to the venture capitalist and then they give you money and it's done. But in reality, the venture capitalist give you money, but then they turn around and then they go and they pitch these fund of funds and pension plans and ask for money under the premise that they're specializing in something. And then those pension plans get money from fund of funds. And, and oftentimes the, the pension plans of the parents of the kids that were starting companies. And it's this full circle of life. Everyone's asking for another chain of the stool around the, the circle. And it, it's, it's pretty interesting. But so a lot of times the, the lack of alignment is also structural between an investor and the entrepreneur. That's kind of my background. I think the things that I have the most opinions on, as I said before, I'm much more of a jack of all trades, master of nothing now. But I've made mistakes in just about every facet of entrepreneurship. So at least that's a, a rich source of, of funny stories. And um, happy to talk about angel investing, happy to talk about venture, or more about Mavron. Um, the most recent Series A that, that I've done that is publicized is August, which is the connected lock and connected device with Jason Johnson and Eve Bahar. And one of the theses is for me personally, especially at Mavron, we started looking around this internet of things and connected device space. And we looked at everything from the, the platforms to the individual devices. And the more time we spent, I believe there's gonna eventually emerge an Android or something that makes all these devices connect together. But you know, I heard a quote from Scott McNeely of Sun that says, you know who owns the platform is whoever has the most effing devices. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I actually think talking now to all the manufacturers and the CE manufacturers and the Comcast and the plumbing, everyone's so gun shy that they're gonna get cut out of the equation that everyone's kind of playing defense. And, and that's kind of this islands of things phenomena. And my belief is somebody's gotta keep having, like the Nest, break out individual single devices that work no one goes in the store and wants to buy a hub unless you're a maker or a hacker. I mean, the mainstream audience doesn't actually do that. It's got to be individual devices. And then when there's enough critical mass and people are starting to buy their second and third device, then all of a sudden you're going to start to see them play nicer together. And so I think starting off the platform, again, it's just my opinion, is be a great outcome, but I think it's unlikely. At the same time, with individual devices, I'm a big believer that when you look at these devices, it has to kind of appeal as much to the heart as it does the head. And maybe that's just from spending all day looking at consumer deals. You know, we're investors in Pinkberry and Potbelly and Cranium, in addition to many tech companies. And, you know, I have two nests at my house, and I know the, the brand promises it saves me a bunch of money, but I actually think, and, and it's true of most people I know that have bought nests when I ask them, that they just use that as an excuse to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars replacing their thermostat, which kind of works. And in reality, I've never spent more money in my life on my heating and my cooling bill because, you know, before I used to open the window when it was two degrees off, and now that, that thing's going on and off like it's nobody's business. But I still think it's really cool every time I walk up to it and it flashes and when someone asks me what that thing is. And in a lot of ways, I bought it because it's a cool gadget as well as it's got some utility. Now, there's definitely use cases like 
you know, when I'm not home, coming back from a trip, I can turn it on. It warms up my house a little before I get there. And so when I'm looking at these different devices, I'm definitely looking for something that's got a magical experience and solves a problem, but also something that's got a bit of that object of desire. And I think that's really important. It makes me feel like I'm current. It makes me feel like I'm up to date and I have cool stuff. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I think August really resonated. I think that there's no question that the Jetsons house is going to exist. We've had key fobs in our cars for years and years. And every time you walk in with a bag of groceries or you have to track down uh, a friend of your kids or somebody you're, you're renting out your house to and make the key exchange, and then you count how many keys are out in the wild, none of it makes sense in, in the distant future. But to date, with all the competition in the lock space, it's been such a letdown, and it's something where there's no margin for error. And that's another belief I have, is that the margin for error as people are moving things like connected devices closer and closer to their core needs, like locks or, or like this Nest fiasco when houses were freezing for a couple days because the, uh, the firmware didn't push the right way, um, the margin for error is much, much lower. Uh, you know, locking somebody into their house when you have a fire or locking somebody out of their house when they need to get home, or unlocking the door when, when, a, when a thief comes by are all fatal problems, unlike you know, maybe if your Angry Birds doesn't work for a day, which just feels pretty bad, by the way. But it's not in the same league. And I, I think you're starting to see much more of these. Um, so I think that one of the things about I was saying about the lock space is it's lots of competition, but nobody's delivered that magical experience. In reality, a lot of them, the form factor and the industrial design, doesn't look like somebody, something that somebody would be proud to have in their house, and certainly not something that would instigate somebody walking and go, wow, I want that, what is that? So I think combining the industrial design side, appealing to the heart, and having a magical experience, not just in locks, but in other, other connected devices is something that you know, is part kind of core to our thesis. So a bunch of ramblings, what can I answer for you guys? Anybody? So one of the things you mentioned was having startup things by We've been debating what to do about a seat round recently, or, um, and we've heard some, we have friends who have experience and very strong opinions both ways on angel syndicates, ranging from, eh, it's expensive money, don't touch it, to it's crazy town, you'd have to be stupid not to, not to go there as soon as you could. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some pieces of advice about fundraising at the seed round level. We can extend that to the A round a little bit as well. Um, one, one thing I would say is Naval's got this quote that I like, you know, at Angelus. He says that every, every seed round he sees is, is unfundable till it's oversubscribed. And there is such a tipping phenomena. And, and as much as you wish it wasn't so from both sides, there's definitely kind of a herd mentality on the fundraising side. It's about supply and demand. In reality, the more professional investor you are, you only have so many hours in the day and you're gonna focus on the ones that you're gonna lose if you don't actively do something as opposed to the ones that you know, you can wait and time is on your side. I think that one of the things that was incredibly frustrating for me, this is gonna be a winding answer by the way, um, about entrepreneurship raising money is when you're raising money, it is literally the most important thing you're thinking about. And, and it's, it's all you're thinking about because it's survival. And, and you know, they often say the only two reasons companies go out of business is you run out of heart or you run out of, run out of cash. That's really the only two reasons you, run out, you, you die. Whereas on the venture side, literally you're meeting with hundreds and hundreds of companies on a very regular basis. And you know, not any one of them is that important. In aggregate, you really don't want to miss the one deal that you really wanted, but it, you're, you're, it, it does, it, there's a huge asymmetry in how important that one individual meeting is, and it, it's really a weird thing. And in fact, it elicits really bad behavior sometimes, and I hate to see, but now that I'm on the venture side, you know, the typical, yeah, great meeting, never get back to you, never tell you what's going on, and don't even give you feedback because in theory, the, the opaqueness of the business and the transparency is all gone and it's better to keep optionality of, well, I'm not gonna tell them this company's no good because what if it changes in a couple months? There's no downside. And so one thing I try to do as an entrepreneur, I try to flip it the other way. So I try to get my nose really fast and tell them why. And, and it's not always easy to do, but that's kind of one thing we start with. So with that asymmetry in mind, what happens on the seed round is really different. And this is on the A as well, if you're being courted or if you're knocking on doors. Big difference, and so you know, if everyone can be in a perfect world at every round, you've accomplished enough that you're being courted. And 
easy to say, but that, that, you know, that's kind of the, the perfect situation, is if you have enough runway to get to the next local maximum in your story enough that you have kind of multiple bidders or multiple people chasing you. Because for venture capitalists, the dirty secret is you have, they're generally risk averse and you have to create more fear of missing the next big thing than the fear of investing in a loser. I mean, that's kind of the mentality, right? And so I always say you're only as good in M&A or in fundraising as your second best term sheet or your second best offer. If you only are negotiating against one person, then in general, they're gonna be really slow, they're gonna give you really bad terms and it's gonna drag, 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 drag. So first context, and I did spend a year at Redpoint Ventures as an entrepreneur in residence when I was debating whether to be an entrepreneur some more or go try the venture thing. And I was just shocked and amazed, it's sort of subtle that I could kind of pigeonhole almost every deal into either a buy side deal or a sell side deal. And immediately you could tell because either the entire firm was brainstorming why do we even like this thing? Is this thing any good? Or how are we going to win this thing? And how are we going to win this thing means how are we going to take them out to dinner? Who do we know that we can call to call these guys and impress them? How do we knock the legs out of our competition that also wants to win this deal? That's a fun, fun problem to have when you're on the entrepreneur side is when there's too much demand for your company. Okay? So that's the first thing is figuring out, you know, as you coordinate your money, how do you get enough traction to be on the, on the, being courted side is a great thing. Back to the, to the seed round, I think one thing interesting that's happening now on the seed stage is that there are more options now than ever before. It used to be that you raised money from a single entity and it was control, advice, and cash. And they're all lumped together like a, like a boom box. Now you can actually separate those three things out and like a component stereo, get them from different places. And it's a really interesting phenomenon. I think 10 years ago this never happened. But you see people now saying, well, I'm going to take the highest dollar value of dumb money from some rich family office or you know, some YouTube millionaire that's passive. I'm going to get advice from people in industry and give them 25 basis points each off the cap table. And they'll give me free advice. And I'm not even going to do control. For now, I'm just going to opt out of control. And I think that there's a double-edged sword to that, which is I'd rather have no control than bad control any day of the book. As you get later in the game, you generally are going to give up control, so you probably want to orchestrate it so the control goes to the right people. But that's a fascinating thing where none of this could happen in the past. Um, back to your specifically around the seed round, one of the things that I was kind of alluding to earlier is when you look at the seed round, there are more sources of capital than ever before, and the reasons for investing are more diverse than ever before in the past. Right? When they were clumped together, it was generally kind of early stage you know, institutional investors that were in it for a certain reason, primarily to make money. I think that now, in the seed round, you'll see investors that are doing it anywhere from they have no hobbies, to they want to pay it forward, to they want to make money, to they want to dip their toe into becoming famous because they found the next big thing, to they want to see if they could be the next venture capitalist. And it just really, really ranges the gamut. I think when you look at syndicates, and that could be in the form of kind of old school syndicates like the Band of Angels or like you know, the Angel Forum or Koretsu. There's some homogenous basis to the people that are part of the syndicates, so their reason for investing are more similar. And so I would say that if you're considering a syndicate type of route, you really want to get underneath you know, what's the core reason they want to invest and how aligned is that with you know, what you're trying to put together. At, at a 10,000 foot level, I, I often describe the band angels, which I'm pretty involved in still, as these syndicates as much more value investors. And it's, you know, it's not always true, but in general, when you look at these you know, syndicates that are you know, 50 to 60-year-old ex-operating guys, they generally are investing in what I would call value investments. Their, their ideal is a Series A deal that for some reason is going for a Series C price and maybe needs a little help along the way. And that's what they're very good at because these are operating guys that understand numbers, are not really into hype, and in fact have been burned a lot of times when they made an early stage investment, something was successful, and as you, the company raised more and more money, actually crammed out their ownership. And so they've had all, quite a bit of scar tissue around big successful companies that they invested early and did not make money. And so as a result, what do they like? They like something that's got less risk, lower price, and a lot of them all day long will invest in something in a $3 million valuation, which is probably closer to the right valuation, what it should be, or maybe on the low end, 
and selling it back to a company at 30 before any of this funding drama and push-pull hits. And so that's one thing to think about. It's not a bad thing. I mean, for a lot of people, that, that, that is a good exit. You, that's probably the easiest 10-bagger you'll find is find the right sector, build something early, and sell it off early. Um, AngelList is you know, a pretty wide variety of different investors. I've, I've talked to a few investors that are very, very high um, frequency investors on AngelList. I was talking to a guy the other day that in the first 45 days made 30 investments in this year. So it's about one every other day kind of thing. Um, and I asked him, you know, what are your 10 criteria for investments? And making money was not one of the 10, and return investment was not one of the 10. It was the other answers I gave, which is, I made money on my exit, I want to pay it forward. I, I don't have any hobbies. I want to be part of cool stuff. Those are kind of cool investors to have, right? Maybe. It depends what you're looking for. Um, a lot of these guys on AngelList, I often say, are momentum investors. They're looking for kind of that Series C deal that for some reason is going for a Series A price. Oftentimes, the AngelList investors, the social proof of who else is in the round matters almost too much. So there's a, definitely a lot of lemming behavior, which is if you get somebody that is a semi-celebrity or somebody that is people look up to an angelist to kind of start the investment, then the rest kind of fall in place. Now the downside is you get a lot of guys with not a lot of skin and it's a little bit like herding cats where you may get lots of small checks or you get people that you know, are in lots of deals and are flying around and it's just a low priority for them. And, and oftentimes I've seen an inverse correlation between how prestigious the named investors are in like an angelist syndicate and how much value they actually add because the ones that are doing lots of great deals and, and have a lot of fame from their company are generally pretty busy guys. And so you'll see that a lot as well. I have seen a lot of trying, uh, one of the tactics is to get a named brand person on AngelList or, or that type of thing to lead it by giving better economics. I, I've even been in a pitch where in the middle of the pitch, people are saying, you know, but we'll give you better economics than the rest if you lead it because we know that when you're in, other people will be in. And it, it's, it's kind of an interesting kind of poker game going on over there. The other thing on the momentum side is the optics of having a $1 million round that is $700,000 filled and there's only $300,000 left versus having a $300,000 round that zero is filled is, is immensely different. And so you know, a lot of times you'll see on the momentum investing side, orchestrating something that looks like a smaller round and making it look like it's mostly filled up to get people kind of off their seats and, and, and kind of going through the process. Um, for hardware, I would say, especially hardware and consumer, hardware and consumer generally don't fit a very good mold for value investing type of syndicates. And the reason being is generally, now this is changing thanks to people like, like Highway One and Flex and things like that, they, they're thought of as high capital intensive businesses. And so that doesn't fit the mold of getting a good 10x return on a early investment and getting out early because the bar, although it's coming down a lot to success, is generally raising a fair amount of money along that way. And the, the gaps between kind of your local maximum of how the course of your company looks are, are kind of further apart. And so in general, in the sectors that you guys play, it's not, usually not a great fit for you know, the band angels or for angel Kind of traditional angel syndicates. Now, it's not a never say never. Actually, on the flip side, on the angelist side, these are categories that are kind of heating up because a lot of guys that made quick money at Twitter and Facebook and YouTube think that these categories are kind of cool categories and they tend to overweight the makers and the, the young tech forward. And so it's a little bit of fit there as well. I actually think that, and, and I go to angel list once a week still and we help pick the features and these tend to be categories that get a lot of buzz. One of the challenges, though, that's happening more and more, especially with the advent of you know, crowdfunding and more incubators, a lot of the questions like that I ask is, let's just assume this first product that you're building actually is going to work. How does this become a big company? Because it looks like there's going to be a lot of lifestyle businesses built. And in fact, some of the promise of a lot of these devices are things that are going to require a subscription or SaaS-based revenue for a long period of time. And you may have gotten behind the eight ball enough that you're spending all your time just trying to fulfill that and there's no guarantee that three, four years after the product ships that it's even going to be around. And so I think that's one of the challenges is, you know, historically hardware companies were really hard to build and now all of a sudden chapter one just got a lot easier. 
but chapter two and chapter three and chapter four are much, much harder. So having the team and having enough quality of thought about what happens after that first device is a success is kind of what weeds out the, the obvious investments for the ones that look like it's going to be a, a, a kickstarter lifestyle business. I don't know. Um, so one of the things that's been recommended to us um, when I work in fashion, so I've already been through the syndicate guys, they don't tend to really respond well to that in general, which has been my experience. Yep. So I've been, I've been looking in other areas and one of the suggestions was to find somebody, let's say Burberry, who is a large company who has the same general large vision as you do for the future and have them invest in your company. I just heard this a couple of days ago. What is that? And how does how does that work? Um, I don't even know what kind of investment. That's not angel, and it's not a syndicate. So I don't really know how that works. So <laughs> if you can describe that. Going back to so when I started off, I was talking about in the beginning when it's kind of it, it's going to be kind of hard to raise money until it becomes easy. When it's kind of hard to raise money, you have to kind of do a balance between plugging along somehow finding money to get to the next milestone versus knocking a lot of doors. You have to balance that based on your cash flow and can you stay in business and you know, your, your quality of life. It's kind of a, a hang around the hoop scenario, which is just stall, which is kind of interesting, but I'm not gonna put money right now, but most people would say, I'm not gonna say no, I'm just gonna say, great to meet you, let's kind of keep in touch. You're gonna get that a lot if you go too early on. on you should look at a venture fund or a, a seed fund, figure out typically when do they go. And if you're too early, that's generally the answer you're gonna get is a, for optionality's sake, just kind of stall. I think that you're not gonna get that on strategics, but on strategics, you're just gonna be, it's gonna be really slow. Cause there's usually layers of bureaucracy that has to make it up and back down. And someone along that bureaucracy is gonna wanna see some level of success that maybe you haven't achieved yet. So if you're pre-product or you're pre this. Now if it's a perfect fit, you know, there's always the, you know, your product or your, your piece of clothing gets in the hand of the right person that falls in love with it. And that's kind of true of angel investing as well, which is, you know, if you get a prototype in the hands of somebody, in general, if you have a bunch of money and you fall in love with somebody, you know, you may want to invest. And that's true of, of angels, that's true of investors, and that's true of strategics. But strategics are generally kind of slow. Um, there's a lot of strategies of when to bring strategics in and how much. Generally, strategics are cost insensitive. So if you have, you're in a position that you have a strong enough hand that you think you can get investors from a couple different sources, but you're optimizing on price, that's a great time to add a strategic to the mix because they are the least price sensitive. Um, I generally don't like strategic leading it because often if a strategic leads around, maybe not on the, maybe not on the early, early seed, but in general, if a strategic leads the round, that generally means they have enough skin in the game. They're trying to kind of buy a cheap option on buying the company later. And that creates a lot of bad signaling, either A, if later on you ever want to sell the company, or B, even if later on you want to do a fundraise, them knowing that there's this person that may take it off the table early on creates some unrest in the VC's eyes. So I often think the best time to bring a strategy again is on that A round or the B round when you want to create some upward pressure on the pricing power of raising the round because it's kind of anti-dilutive, you know, non-price sensitive money, but not in the lead spot. Um, now, they're so long lead that, and it's slow. I mean, a lot of experience I've had, because at Homestead we went through many cycles and took money from many strategics and they went through so many cycles that oftentimes, like, we'd buy the stock back off them along the way and it would, it would go in and out and funny things have happened. That by the time you've gone a couple cycles, you're just dealing with a whole completely different set of people than when you first started talking to them because these big companies, there's just a lot of transition and turnover and changes in strategy along the way that, if you think that might be the route, like in fashion, you, you might start now because you want to take their money in the A or B round. Like that's how slow it can be. Um, it's, it's just a lot of, it takes a while to get enough penetration and bureaucracy up and down the levels. I think on the earliest stage, you kind of have to think about when in that arc you think you have the best story. In some cases, you have the best story slightly before launch. In some cases, you flip over the card of demand, which is I've done a Kickstarter or I've done a crowdfunding, and I sh I've proven somewhat that there's demand, and I haven't quite built it yet, but I need the money to build it. Maybe that's the optimal time. Um, the further towards your kind of local maximum of your best story, the better you are. Uh, a lot of people try to fundraise too early, and it, you know, it's just not going to take. So you kind of want to get to a point of view where you raise 
just enough money to get you to that next milestone plus a little bit more and then get back to work. I know that a lot of the incubators like Paul Graham and, and such, especially on the seed round, say these analogies that I hate, but that it's a very transactional approach. And that may be okay, but I think it's not without risk at the seed level. But it, it's, I really feel strongly it's the wrong approach as you keep getting further and further along, your A round, your B round. But at the seed level, you know, he always says that, that raising your seed round is like, you know, is like hunting in the, in the wild where you know, you're a hunter and, they're, and, and VCs are a buffalo and you want to go out and you want to shoot as many as you can and then get back to work. And that, that's kind of a provocative way of thinking of it and it's kind of extreme. And, and you could really bring in the wrong people. But a lot of that early stage side is getting in front of a bunch of different people and figuring out what you actually can and can't do and when's that ideal time to raise. Because a lot of times it is hard until it gets easy and it's gonna be really hard, you know? But if you have the right story and you can start to get momentum, then it completely flips. Uh, so we're an interesting case. So we're, we're a very unsexy product, actually. We're, we're, and we're, we have this platform vision you talked about. You start with a product and you build out the platform. Um, because we're selling into sort of small business and enterprise markets, we've had decent interest from syndicates, traditional syndicates, but I've found that they're really interested in your immediate business plan and it's tough to sell them on a vision. That's right. Is, have you found, like, is there a strategy to get past that? Because it's tough to get people excited when you're looking at the next two years revenue as opposed to we're going to be the instrument that everybody uses. So I'm a big believer in, in selling to your audience. And, and when you're raising money, it is exactly that the case. And so, you know, often the, the pitch I would coach someone to pitch, like the Van Angels or Karetsu, is really a different pitch than I would sending someone in to go, you know, pitch the ball. And with the syndicates, think about who they are. And in general, the syndicates are somebody that's probably got 30, 40 years of the semiconductor industry or a, a big farm, you know, medical device company and is an operating guy, probably has managed really large teams, probably ha look, has looked at a lot of dashboard, and probably has a really high BS sensor. And generally, they completely underweight passion, vision, and charisma. This is the truth, because you've seen too much of the shtick, right? Whereas, you know, on Angelus, you get a lot of people that love, like, I don't care what you've done. Just tell me the big story, how you're gonna change the world, how mission-driven you are, and, and how hard you're swinging for the fences. It's such a different story. On, on an Angel Syndicate, they want to know what you've done so far and what leads me to believe there's some pattern in your accomplishments that are going to allow you to do what needs to be done next and that you're not going to get carried away and not take the easy, the, the obvious money maker when it hits. And that's kind of what they're looking for, right? And so they're looking for quality of thought. How much control of your business do you have and your track record and your history? You probably don't need to talk about that big vision that much if you're going down the syndicate side and uh, with these seasoned operating guys. You need to really understand your business and draw a picture of there's not a lot of market risk that really is just execution risk and you can handle that execution risk because you're good. And if, if that's a 30 or $40 million exit, then that's great, you know? Most people give the Bull Durham answer when I ask, are you, you know, kind of, are you building a big company or small company, which is, I don't know, but you know, praise the good Lord, I'm just happy to, you know, happy to be out here every day swinging the bat, you know? Um, and, and in general, I think, the body language and how else they talk gives you the answer of really when you get that hundred million dollar or that billion dollar exit, are you gonna take it or are you gonna, you know, you're gonna do an Andrew Mason or, you know, something, keep, keep going or, or how you gonna handle that. But like I'm saying, on these syndicate guys, that's what they're looking for. That, you know, how thoughtful you're about the existing business and they want the hard diligence and they want the numbers and they want you to know the numbers. I have a product question less about investment. Sure. So but about what you're saying about chapters three, four, five for a company, um, you mentioned hardware turning to SaaS as a, as a model. I, guess, well, I was wondering what your personal opinion was on sort of the long-term viability of, so sort of like three options, I guess. Doing that SaaS model, which is kind of like, I guess, drop cam, which you know you have to keep paying to make your hardware useful. The second would be the hub, like Nest, moving into smoke detectors and sort of one product and then build a lot of products and then your company, or third, you're like, GoPro, one product that's just so perfect for that user that you just are a company on that one, which somehow you're not a Kickstarter project. Right. So I'm going to answer this again kind of from a, a side direction, which is I think there are a lot of ways to, to figure out that chapter two, three, four for a hardware company. I think that a mistake I often see, one is there are some companies that are really just kind of one-trick ponies and they have the DNA of a one-trick pony, they have a product that looks like it doesn't have any logical adjacencies to what it's doing. And 
is probably going to be a lifestyle business. So put that aside for a second. Let's assume you have a product that is a good entry point product. And the question is, do you go this way? Do you go this way? And what does that mean? I think a lot of people think too much and take kind of an MBA type approach, which is let's look at the market, let's boil the ocean, let's do a top down and bottom up and figure out what's going to happen. I, maybe I'm brainwashed, but I spent all my time thinking from the consumer side, which is really what does the consumer want? And, and one of the things that I've noticed is going to CES last couple of years, the explosion in like the wearable category. The wearable category is simultaneously when I go to CES and see racks and racks and aisles and aisles of kind of the same device is that it's still somewhat early and niche, and yet it feels commoditized. And that's confusing to me as a customer, right? Um, and at the end of the day, I think people underweight the power of brand. And I think that brand has changed a lot because of social media, because of the web. The people are buying on a brand promise of what a brand represents as much as what one individual device is. I mean, Starbucks is probably one of the best examples anywhere, which is, it's still just a cup of coffee, but they're doing $15 billion of revenue on a $5 AOV, which is f kind of freaking insane, right? Because of the brand promise of what it stands for. And that comes from the experience you get when you walk in the door all the way to what Howard represents and, and, and who he is and the authenticity of what he's building. So the first thing I would start off with, let's say you were building, I don't know, a, a camera that sticks on the table. If you were building that, and a lot of people have them, you want to think about that end customer, which is, are they integrating that into their actual lives? And what does that give you license to do with kind of the economics? And if that means that you're going to take money on a SaaS basis, on a regular basis from that end customer, so be it. In general, there's a pretty high bar to take money on a subscription basis from an end customer. Most people hate recurring billing, on, except for things that they feel like they're getting value on a monthly basis. People hate to feel like they're getting extorted out of money that they can't shut off. But you know, Netflix actually kind of works the other way, which is every month you're, you're feeling like, I got more than my $8 worth. And so I think one of the things on the consumer side is, are you, if you're above that bar for a monthly subscription, because on a monthly basis, it's not a gym membership where you regret signing up. It's a, something you're signing up for that you're like, damn right, I paid my eight bucks this month. You know, I feel like I'm ripping off this business then that's great. So I would definitely look at that because that SaaS model changes the unit economics and that kind of customer acquisition cost versus lifetime value dramatically. Okay? But these kind of boxes of the month club where they're sending you a box of junk, there are about a million of those at the same time, most of those died out because people just don't like paying on a subscription basis. I think whether you expand into other devices or go deeper in your device really depends on what that entry point is and what you have license from a customer to build. Now, you don't want to blindly just build what the customer says, because a lot of times customers don't know. They can't see very far in their future. So you end up, I think most great entrepreneurs have a very strong internal compass. You know, kind of the Steve Jobs effect, you know, say that, you know, if you ask customers, no one would ever say they wanted an iPod or wanted, you know, an iPhone. But you need a strong internal compass and still listen to your customers. And I think one of the keys in listening to customers is, what does your brand promise give you license to build that's adjacent to that? You know, one of the great investments that we did recently was Zoo Lily and, and went public for a great valuation early um, this year. And it's a flash site sales site for moms. And, and what we found is that the end customer, these moms were coming in every morning at 6 a.m. in the morning and spending that 6 to 6.10 in the morning literally shopping for this long tail of the deals that day. And it was a very habitual process. And then we started finding actually that there are a lot of adjacents that moms aren't just buying, don't want to just buy stuff for their kids, but also want to buy stuff for themselves or want to buy furniture for their houses. And what we started to see is that it, because of that behavior and, and who that end customer was, we had a lot of license to test our way into selling a lot of other stuff. So I would encourage you guys to start with what's that real customer value proposition and what do they want and what does it give you license to also sell them? Okay. So you mentioned uh, angel lease. You know, a lot of investors there are like momentum type and the wearable uh, technology is like more like becoming hot. So sounds like it's, it's the, the platform we, uh, you, know, you know, our company Sensei would like to uh, look into. Uh, but you also said uh, uh, they are looking for serious C and serious A price. So you know, for doing a C round, what, what do you think? Is it the right place to, to look into to spend that on the platform or, or uh, when 
you know, the business grows up and it comes to a serious C and we feel we can offer a bucket price. Is so I, I would think, so, <laughs> so an angel list, what I can tell you is, so every week we look and try to figure out um, what are good companies to feature and what are the characteristics of good companies. So one, I would think almost everybody, even the non-sexy ones, are categories that fit the demographic of the people on AngelList. I think that on AngelList, if you have the perception of social proof as well as some business momentum, that's ideal, you have both. Um, the Even if, if, for example, we are like very early, like, you know, Ideally, you have both. You, know, you don't always have both. I actually think on AngelList, don't, don't quote me on this, social proof is probably worth a teeny bit more than momentum proof, um, which is very different than the other syndicates I'm talking about. So if you have you know, a quality lead investor in the rounds halfway full, even if you don't have you know, a, uh, if you don't have consumer demand or product shipping yet, you might be able to get that round done. You know? But if you have zero investors and you got a little momentum, that's a tougher one. So in general, I, I often think AngelList is a good place to go when your round is halfway done. If you've kind of, or you've gotten two or three great investors that are in, and then you can catch momentum behind those couple great, it, 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 if you can get the ball up the hill a little bit, AngelList is a great place to let the ball kind of roll back down the hill a little bit. Um, now, if you've got a couple good investors that are somewhat name brand investors or have some cloud or you can talk to, well, I got these guys and they're really smart and you have some business traction and in, in, in a hardware business that mean, might mean different things. That might be you vapor tested demand or you got a prototype into 100 customers and they love it or you got a fake you know, 3D printed mock-up that you could give to an investor and when they play with it, they'll, they'll love it. There, it could mean a lot of different things, you know. I, I, I put $5 million into, um, into August pre-product based on the two team guys, the early, early prototypes, and the fact that without taking credit cards, they got, you know, 30, 40,000 pre-orders via email in the first couple of days. And, and you know, th those combinations was enough for me, plus the fact it fit my thesis. But there were some hard metrics there that made sense to me as, as momentum indicators. And as I mentioned, for me, I'm gonna overweight the team every single day over the momentum because that's the style of investing that we do. It doesn't mean it's the right way, it's just the way we do investing. Um, so I would say that if you go to AngelList, you don't have any investors yet, and you don't have any product, and you haven't done any crowdfunding, you're probably gonna be cold rejected. I think that's just the style there, unless you're a serial entrepreneur and you've got you know, some great hits before, or, or your team is a A plus team. If you are not one of those guys, then either, you know, if you have some great crowdfunding, and it looks like it's that, or it's, like I said, it's a product that makes sense, that a lot of people are looking for, that were like, God, finally someone built this and my checkbook's burning a hole in my pocket, then you're gonna get some investors. And nothing beats having some investment momentum on AngelList, you know? So I have a question about process in terms of like seed round. Um, obviously there, there are multiple investor, investors in a seed round. So I had questions about the process of how that actually comes together. Okay. Yeah. More specific. Um, well, you know, as um, I'm starting to look at potential seed funders, et cetera, um, uh, I'll be pitching more to a fellowship type group in about a week and a half, which might be a small amount if I'm successful with it. But of course, the round that I need is much larger than that. So I'm trying to figure out Got it. what's that process then to take a win, hopefully. So, <laughs> you know, moving forward. one, the fact that you're in Highway 1 gives you a little bit of an endorsement. That's kind of good. I, I think that there's kind of these distinct phases. The first phase is, when you can raise money only for people that you know. And you may be lucky and that means your friends and family, that means you have your rich uncle. That may be that there's people that are somewhat successful that you've gotten to know, you went to school with many years ago or you worked together with. And so the first X hundred thousand dollars is generally, I think there's a big line in the sand when a company is mature enough, they can raise from strangers as opposed to raising money from somebody they know. And that's a huge line in the sand. In general, once you can raise money from a few strangers, you can raise money from many more strangers. It doesn't mean you can raise from the best, best investors, but that's a very, very bright line in the sand for me. And so a lot of times companies are in a camp where really you can only raise money from, from people you know, and you're trying to raise money from strangers, and it's, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. And ideally, you find more people you know, or you just hang on tight and get a little more successful and then go out because that's about the hardest thing you can do is if you're not ready to raise money from strangers and you're trying, it's just a really, really frustrating process. Um, 
if you're in between those and you don't have the luxury of getting a little more milestones, whether, to, you know, listen really closely to the first couple times you meet with strangers and try to pitch them and see, ideally pitch people, not your best message, but the ones that are gonna give you the most honest feedback and figure out what's missing to the story. They're gonna say, well, yeah, unless you get some consumer demand until you do a crowdfunding campaign to show me you can raise the money, this seems interesting, but I'm not that interested. Or until you can get me a prototype that I can play with, I don't see why someone invests in that. So I would start off with strangers that are gonna be honest with you and tell you what's missing and then try to solve that. Now, if you're not lucky enough to be able to solve and get enough momentum to get to the next point, then the first strangers that you're gonna have a chance taking money from are probably people that have very, very strong thesis in exactly what you're building. And that's, it's, it's a fine line because they may be conflicted because of other investments, but you wanna look for people that both in terms of stage and in terms of the types of investments they're making, or ideally the types of investments they've been looking at but not making because they're waiting for somebody who actually looked like that other company they want to invest in but was messed up and solved that problem. That's your best bet. Um, so I would say first stage, take as much money as you can from people that you know. I know it's, it's sometimes a really hard thing to do, but I would start there. And you know, sometimes you don't want to take money from your in-laws and sometimes you have to, but so you figure out, you know, everyone hopes for a rich uncle that, that is not gonna stick their neck in, but you gotta kinda raise money from people you know first, and hopefully that gets you enough to get enough momentum to start to take some money from strangers. So what's your opinion then on federal funds? Um, I, I've been funded through the National Science Foundation, so that's kinda like my non-dilutive, right. you know. Um, but how, how does the VC world then look upon? You know, I think that the, the institutional investors are fairly indifferent to non-dilutive funding in terms of the endorsement, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, and especially the more professional investor you, you are, the less you, you want to believe that your judgment is swayed by other people's endorsement as opposed to competitive endorsement. Like, a lot of VCs, they'll never admit it, but are really swayed by, I don't want to lose this deal to my arch rival VC. So that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But earlier people coming in, I don't think is nearly as much signaling as you think, as you may think in terms of who made the endorsement earlier. Because I take pride in, I'm going to value what you got now because the person back then didn't see what you had or because somebody who's generally not a good investor did see what you have is, is less relevant. I think VCs love the fact that it's non dilutive funding because it's sort of like the cap table has more room for everybody. I mean, I mean, investors want want the the entrepreneurs to have more ownership so they're in this, you know, with both legs and you know, investors want more for themselves as well. So the non I I you know, as long as it's not so distracting, the more non dilutive funding you have, the better. I think that's a great thing. And as long as there's not weird strings. Sometimes there's strings like there's non-dilutive funding sources that are overseas that have restrictions that you can't sell back to the other country and it gets complicated. But in general, I think it's looked at favorably from a non-dilutive point of view and from an endorsement point of view, it's a neutral. Can you talk a little about uh, how to show your, uh, endorse the market, reduce the market risk and show the market uh, really wants your product when we're doing hardware. You know, it's very expensive to build the prototypes. What we used to be able to do was crowdfunding, but now that's becoming an expensive game. You really do the ad spend and you want to make it big. So you mentioned, you know, if you can put a, the right prototype in front of an investor and they get excited about it, but maybe there's some more of that. You know, some pre -orders. so I'm biased because I'm a product guy at heart. But for me, my first intuitive is, is a good product market fit is getting some MVP of the product in the hands of the target segment. And one of the obvious things that people sometimes discount, but is really true, is most investors and VCs are pretty homogenous. So that's one of the reasons why, like, a zoo lily that appeals to moms or, you know, products that are going after a female tween market often doesn't resonate the same way with the venture market. And so you see a lot of these venture guys that the first thing they do when they get home is ask their niece to play with this product, right? Um, I think getting the product one, you know, there, there's companies that are out like in this, I'm an investor in Postmates that's doing food delivery in the city and such. And there's always these debates in other companies in that category whether they should go to Palo Alto. And it's like, because if a VC gets hooked on the product and then all of a sudden they're gonna like it more. And, and if it's not the best thing for the business but it's the best thing to get it close to VCs, it's always an interesting trade off. I don't think there's a black or white answer there but getting it more relevant to the people who are gonna give you money is always a plus. I think that, what we talked about earlier on this prototypes, it's a little tricky in some of the hardware devices because the MVP may actually not shine enough. 
and, and, it, it, and it may be so small you actually diminish what is the true value that you're bringing. It really but, and it can be very, but if you can get any kind of proxies for that, and, and proxy by analogy or proxy by, you know, you know, whether it's a vapor test, whether it's a paper mock-up, whether it's something you can put in the hands uh, or, or early CAD mock-up or something in the hands of the target market. One of the things that I've noticed recently is kind of a rant of mine is I keep seeing hardware device companies that say, actually, we're a software play, that we're going to get into the market with this hardware device, but we're a SaaS company, and we got this big software thing, and we're in tooling right now. We're shipping next month. And I go, can I see the app? We haven't started yet. And I, in my head, I'm like, you're a software company pitching a software story, and you haven't started any software yet. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? Um, I think that a lot of these hardware devices, if that's the play, could do a lot on the software side that is going to be much cheaper to kind of show product market fit, at least to the prospective investors. Like, I love test flights, and I love, you know, tinkering with stuff, and, and I love CAD cams and those kinds of things. That's not true of all investors, but I think that nothing gets beats getting the reaction of 100 strangers and their reaction to seeing or understanding the value that a product brings to the table. You know? And a lot of people start with the technology side and say, well, I've built this technology, I think people are going to love it, and have done no customer research. And you can do customer research really cheaply. I mean, you can do it on a shoestring. We used to do twice a week, drive to the train station, just draw it on a piece of paper, and what do you think of this? And just iteration after iteration of, of train station you know, user testing. And, you know, with reams and reams and reams of paper, you could tell a story of, here are all the insights we learned along the way, and we haven't coded a single thing, and we haven't, you know, soldered a single thing. So I think that really understanding who that customer is and being really articulate about quality of thought of, let me tell you who Helen is. Helen lives in the Midwest. She's 26 miles away from South Dakota. She makes $72,000 a year, but actually one of her kids left home, which is why she actually has this burning reason. And understanding that customer insight of why they want to do their shopping through Stitch Fix instead of driving to the mall. Like, understanding that customer is not something that a lot of hardware, you know, maker movement people who hack something together get. And I think that that alongside of you have the best engineers in the building is what is going to resonate for people who know what they're doing on this early stage investing. Is that helpful? We only have five minutes to pitch usually. How do you... <laughs> so our product's been in the hands of a lot of people. Is the best thing to do just put a video together and just have like two seconds clips of boom, 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 boom? How do you, I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm just wondering the best way to deliver the information so that investors don't have to do too much work and they still think it's awesome. So I think that um, there's a difference, like you, you nailed it. There's a difference between gathering the right information and knowing the answer, and then how do you present it, right? And that's kind of what you're asking. I think that you, one mistake a lot of companies, I think that it's helpful being part of this kind of program where they encourage you to really get out in front of your customers and your prospective customers and really understand the customers and why they want this thing. If you get to the point that you're like, I know our customers love this thing, I know they want what I built, then the question is how do you articulate that story for your audience? And, and what I talked about earlier is every audience is different and their screening process is different. In, in the syndicated angel groups, they generally outsource the first couple levels of, of the screening process. They send it out to an expert in your field, and it makes their way back. And whether that's the executive summary or their deck, that can be different things. I think that a lot of times these pitches, what, what a lot of people don't realize is when you're pitching an institutional investor, somebody who literally sees probably five or 10 companies a day, their attention span isn't that great, and they only have very limited recollection. So you're not pitching your complete story, you're pitching kind of a movie trailer, which is just give me one thing to hang my hat on, which is interesting enough that when you leave at the end of the day, I can't stop thinking about that one thing and I wanna learn more. So I would encourage more, especially on these early stage kind of investments, a little more of a teaser kind of approach to your pitch. Some people lose their elevation and all you really need to capture is why do I even care about what you're doing and why do I have any reason to believe that you guys have a shot at being the one that wins that and what's interesting about that. So in your case, if you're like, I've talked to hundreds of customers and they're head over tails in love with this, you could back into a lot of creative ways to present that. You know, it could be a movie with snippets. It could just be, you know, you're very charismatic and you're like, look, we've talked to hundreds of people and they're crazy about this thing. You know what I mean? There are a lot of different ways that is authentic to your pitch style, 
but instead of worrying about the completeness of your story, you know, I think if you just got across the one, I've, you've talked to hundreds of people, and these hundreds of people represent not the most fringe hundred weird, strange people in a one niche, but actually is representative of a large enough market. And you know, I think a lot of people will take a leap of faith that what you're telling them is true, but they will have a high filter on whether they care about that result. So if the answer is, you know, people love this thing, they'll throw money at it, then they're gonna like, well, I wanna go one click deeper and understand, let's, let's see if what you're saying is true. So I, I think you could package that up in a lot of different ways, if that makes sense. You mean, you could, you know, bring one person along. I mean, I think you can get really creative with it, but you have to be, you know, respectful of people's time. Sir? We've, uh, we've gathered a few letters of intent for okay. the product. Like, we, we have retail customers that say that, yeah, we can promise to buy a letter of intent. From, from is, retail is, distribution partners? Yeah. Big, big, like big box kind of retail distribution partners or like small or chains or? No, it's, it's big, but it's uh, in, in Sweden. So it's not big in US terms. Okay, got it. And, and offline? Almost, two, yeah, okay. almost 200 stores. Yeah. Uh, but we don't seem to get, like, people don't seem to either not believe us or it doesn't sell good enough. Like, and, what and do you say, what, what would we do the are you sh When are you shipping? In September. So, I think, I, again, it depends on who you talk to, but I think that people are a little gun shy of sell in versus sell through right now. And, um, you know, that's kind of one of the, I don't know if dirty secrets or not dirty secrets, but their sell in is very different than sell through at retail. So, some people, especially that may not understand Europe, or, or might say, I don't understand how easy or hard it is to get an LOI to sell into a store. Now, if you actually had those behind you and you were selling through to end customers, then I bet you their tone would be 180 degrees different. I think it's less that they don't believe you, but you know, even a, some, a lot of sophisticated investors that don't do a lot of hardware would not really understand whether how valuable that is or isn't. Because, yeah, right? I mean, that's the truth. I mean, it, 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 it seems like today, especially on a pre-launch product, it's easier to get LOIs that are non-binding to get sell in, and it doesn't. It may not be correlated at all to ship date and sell through. And at the end of the day, having sell in without sell through is is actually worse than having neither because you're actually going to have this huge liability and and you're going to get all this stuff sent back to you and then you're really in trouble, right? And so I think even in the U.S., a lot of investors are skeptical of what the retailers say they can perform and nobody really knows on these early stage products, especially the more disruptive you are if the customers are gonna eat the dog food. Um, that's why like, I would personally much rather see, even a crowdfunding campaign, I'd rather see something that intuitively, and as I talk to other consumers and put this in pitch this in front of other consumers, whether it feels like they want this, than even a Best Buy saying, yeah, we'll, we'll, with our 50% cut, we'll give it a shot. You know what I mean? So, I, I mean, it, it's great that you have those LIs, it's better than nothing, but nothing's gonna beat having the product start to actually ship and being able to use it and then actually see real customers really buy it. And in fact, I think a lot of people would say going direct to consumer first before you even entertain the retail one and only going to retail when you have somebody who really understands it and really can talk to any given chain or any given place what really happens. The fact that you're not sure how valuable that is makes that investor even more skeptical, which is even if I don't understand, I want to believe that you have an expert on your team that has done this 25 times and knows it dialed. If you don't know it either, then it's not a big plus because it's no one really knows how it's going to perform. And in fact, it could be a fatal error. I think in hardware, the errors are much more costly than in software, right? The mar if you make a mistake, it can, you blink your eye, it's three months behind. And if you retool, it could cost you hundreds of thousand dollars like that. And so a lot of people are gun shy to invest early. And so if, if, if a company has the appearance that you're a little bit of a loose cannon and, and too far ahead of actually your knowledge base, that's also another red flag potentially. Maybe a product question in your experience. So what would you do, I guess, in terms of doing a pre-sales campaign in the life cycle? You know, I'm kind of, I don't know August super well, but I kind of felt like they were one of the earlier, you know, 
get that traction. And we've done a few. I'm an investor in Tile. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's another example that, that has done some really interesting things in the pre pre. Yeah. Um, uh, Live is another one we've done. From, from a high level, it seems that's a pretty damn good approach. What, what's your thoughts on that? In terms of going to market earlier, doing the pre-sales campaign earlier, in, in, or what phase within the development of doing a pre-sales campaign? So I think that the, I, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. I think that one of the things I would ask is, who's your target market? I think that, that a successful crowdfunding campaign endorsement, especially if your target market, your larger target market is somewhat similar to your earlier adopter market, is going to help your fundraising. There's no question. Because one of the biggest questions people have, besides can you build this thing, and do you have you know, some moats or defensive things around the way you guys are going about it, or IP, is does anybody want to buy this thing? And in general, with the false positive risk that this early adopter maker movement is a niche crowd and that the mainstream audience doesn't actually want to buy it that way at all, with that big caveat, it's still better to have a positive, false, negative than nothing at all. So I think that crowdfunding is a very good thing. Um, Timing-wise, I think a failed crowdfunding campaign isn't disastrous, but it's also a big potential false negative or negative either way. So you want to time it so that you are comfortable enough that that thing's going to be successful. There's a lot of ways to game crowdfunding. I mean, in terms of you know, in general, if you look polished and you look like you have VC funding, you actually have a lesser chance of your crowdfunding campaign being successful. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that crowdfund too early and then are putting all their efforts to catch back up and, and, and somehow hold together the, the initial promise and the bomb that they told these guys are going to build. And, you know, you're going to lose a year just trying to arm wrestle with your unhappy early customers. One thing August made a very deliberate decision to do because we knew locks were so difficult and the margin of error was so low that um, that's why they just, that was the reason they did it with email and not with a credit card because they knew that if they start delay, which is always likely, that if you had their credit card, people would get mad. And the space already had Lockatron and several players that had a lot of mad customers and so that's something they did very on purpose. But I'll tell you, the fact that they had a huge number of people sign up even with email helped their fundraising a lot. There was no question that that endorsement. But there was a question, which is, is this an early adopter thing or is this mainstream? And you can kind of sandy check, which is ask 10 people, do you, do you want a retrofit, five minute install, thumb turn lock on your door that's magically opens it and looks pretty, would you want it? And it sanity checks, where I would say there are lots of crowdfunding things that you ask that same question to a random sampling. And, and VCs aren't, you know, genius of this stuff, that's probably what they're going to do, is ask 10 random friends that are sort in the segment, what do you think? And if people are like, that's the stupidest I've ever heard, then it's kind of done, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's definitely the right tool. You want to do it at the right time. You want to be conscious of this early adopter maker type of segment and figure out how do you tell the story around that. It also seems like a, a lot of time, right? You know, if I were to engage on that, you know, the product would slow down. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably some of the... Probably the bigger question right. in my head is, do you, do you tone down, not tone down, but naturally lose a little bit of momentum on the product in order to do the a pre-sale? You know, and, and I think it's more of a tool to give you the cards you need on that product market fit. If you don't need those cards for product market fit and you know you have product market fit, you could skip over that as long as you don't need it for fundraising. So the right. two best reasons to do it is it. either it. you need it to know you're building the right thing or you need to convince somebody else to give you money. And if you need neither of those, right. you know, I would say stay stealth because this, the hardware space is so competitive. Right. And so monetize that I'd rather That's great hold up somewhere else and do yeah. neither. If you need it because you don't even know if the product's right, then you got to do it anyways. If you need it because you know the product right and no one else believes you, Got then it. maybe you can build a working prototype and give it to them and they fall in love with it. And if that's not credible, then you probably want to do crap money. Perfect. So back on the investment side, uh, how do you, again, maybe particular to us, we could take this offline if no one else, but how do you sell unattractive markets to investors? We have a big market, but it's, not necess it's nothing that anyone has made. Oh, it's disruptive, truly disruptive. No one's made a lot of money in this market other than the big players in 50 years, you know, when the big players came up. So you pitch it to an investor and they're like, oh, uh, trades, not interested. Or plumbing electricians, building inspectors, not interested. 
How do you sort of spin that so that investors are interested in something that's lucrative but not on their radar? So this could be a longer conversation tailored to your exact business. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that as you move down the food chain of, kind of institutional professional investors, like I said, they tend to be short attention span. I'm generalizing, and they tend to see a lot of pitches. So they try to bullet point your story and jam it into something. And, and one of their most common things are, is by analogy, right? Which is, how do I tell the story that it's like a blank or it's like a blank and jam it in that category? So, and, and w what we found is even on our late stage investments as they're going public, you're always trying to jam a business story into a traditional analogy. And so when we're pitching bankers on IPOs, you'll get four bankers that are like, you know, we have a company called Trupanion. It is the, it is the fastest growing pet insurance company in the United States. And four of the bankers are like, this feels like an insurance company. And then somebody else says, no, it feels like a SaaS business because actually it's got recurring revenue and they're wildly different models and different kind of businesses. You're always facing that. So I think the first thing you do is you start off with, if I were going to do this by analogy, what are different stories that could be told by analogy? And accept that's how people are going to think about it. And then you want to tell the story that kind of caters into the right direction that you want to push them a little bit. Um, I think that professional investors are generally in the business to make money more than invest in sexy markets. And so I don't think the fact that you're in an unsexy market is bad at all. In fact, there are lots of investors who are like, I take great pride in investing in unsexy markets because that's where the real money's made. So there's nothing wrong with that. You might even embrace that. I think that um, you know, in general, as a venture capitalist, you want to be contrarian and you want to be right, right? And so an undiscovered, unsexy market, and the reason it's undiscovered is because it's unsexy is actually a good thing. The real question is, is this thing gonna make money? And so if you can tell the story of, this is a sufficiently large enough market, and let me tell you why. And that's when you have to probably be careful that you're not railroaded into a past failed small market. And instead you can tell a story, that, no, this is actually more like this other big market, okay? It's a big enough thing to qualify. I think people care more that it's big enough, kind of eye on the prize, especially professional venture capitalists are looking for you know, a bet on green bet. They're not looking for a return on capital bet. So they would rather see something that's got an 80% chance of failure, but if it goes, it's gonna go. And so telling a story to a, you know, this is exact opposite for those, you know, they, the, the, um, the, syndicate. the syndicate guys. But if you're talking to venture capitalists, they want a vision of, you know, this is gonna be a multi-billion dollar business. This is gonna be an IPO, let me tell you why. And IPO is just the beginning. You know, Our best CEOs that have gone public, I think that's just the beginning. And they want that kind of mentality, which is failure is not an option. You know, I'm the next Jeff Bezos and you're the world. They kind of want to see that kind of DNA and tell me a story of why I can believe that. Why does that make sense? You know, is, is this really going to be one in every household? Or is this, you know, something that everybody's going to use? And once you use this, you'll never be able to imagine life without it. You know, telling that story is important. And I, I wouldn't get caught up in the unsexiness. Yeah. So you, so you, you uh, mentioned that in the wearable uh, space, uh, you know, looking into a different uh, business model, you feel that uh, it has a better chance to succeed for a startup to start with uh, some unique hardware with a unique uh, features or special features like unique value proposition and data goes into a, a platform or you know maybe an additional business model on top of the hardware revenue. So when, when you look into like in the early uh, stage uh, startups, how much do you uh, look into the potential to go beyond the hardware uh, revenue, uh, which could you know, potentially improve the profit margin, like, right. with, uh, like right. additional, uh, you know, whatever, you know, extraction of the data, you know, like the service or whatever. So how, how much, you know, focus or, or how, how important is that for you to, uh, to look into a deal? So I would say, taking, I would say of the venture model of investing, where you are kind of looking for high risk, high return kind of bets, the earlier you are, the more you're looking for a vision and a team. And I would argue that you know a lot of the big Sand Hill Row guys are tending to go later on consumer deals because they're like, I can't predict what people are going to like or not, so I'm going to wait till it's got some traction, and then I'm willing to pay up for it because once they go, they go. And so what you'll see is there's a huge step function that 
that if you can get to retail and customers are buying it, all of a sudden it goes for an astronomical valuation because very few people make it out that other side of the, of the funnel. There are a lot of these interesting Kickstarters and then they try to catch up. But if you look from there to getting into the Apple Store and Best Buy and then selling a bunch, that fee whittles way down. And so on the early days, you're kind of looking for the team and a story. And actually the business model, it's really just a spreadsheet. And like, like I can tell you at the seed level especially, but even at the Series A level, it's just a spreadsheet. I'm looking for quality of thought and whether they, there's stupid mistakes. And if I ask them what happens if I change a the self, they know what happens. And if they miss their numbers, if they know how to not run out of money, like those kind of questions. And whether it's on the SaaS model or whether it's on the, the Harvard model, I'm less interested in the actual metrics at that stage than them understand the ramifications of the decisions they're making because you may not actually know. Now, in the wearable market, it's super interesting because I kind of think that the trends are Moore's law that everything in the world is going to have an accelerometer tacked into it because you can, right? And you look at these sensors and sensors are getting smaller, they're getting cheaper, and it's going to be really easy to jam a sensor for just about everything and just about everything, including your skin and band-aids and stuff like that over time. So then you start looking at these wearables and everyone at some core, a lot of them have the same pitch, which is my sensor looks slightly better or works slightly better than the other ones around there or slightly more specialized. And because of that, I'm going to capture all this data. And once I have all this data, then I got this great SaaS licensing model that I uniquely can figure out what the heck you're doing and analyze it, whether it's how healthy you are and what exercise you're doing. I, but, but, but the question is, you know, you gotta, you gotta understand this world where there's gonna be aisles and aisles and all this stuff. The real question I have is not about capturing that data. It's really, you know, how, how, why is your device gonna win? And, and I still think it comes back down to kind of brand and knowing who you are. And there's, there's this overlay that's happening now, which is fashion's kind of colliding. But even some of these specialized, you know, you guys had one in your last class, Ringley, and there's things like that. There's still a lot of questions on, you know, what do the customers really want in terms of this collision of fashion and wearables? And, and what is going to, you know, are the fashion companies going to make them? Or is the tech companies going to make them? And, and, and why are you actually buying it? Uh, so you, you, are, uh, you are the investor of uh, Practice Fusion. Yeah. And I think it's, it's quite a successful <laughs> investment <laughs> so far. Um, so when you uh, first heard about their, their pitch, what, what did you think about it, their team, you know, their, uh, the people there? Yep. Like I, because I, I know some people who did not get into a practice fusion, feeling that <laughs> the team like, feels like weird. Like <laughs> not, uh, uh, so what, what, what do you think about that? Why, why, why did you like So he's asking project? about, as it turns out, the first angel investment I ever made is a company called Practice Fusion. And Practice Fusion has become the largest electronic medical record company. Um, when I invested in Practice Fusion, the CEO, Ryan Howard, um, and, and you know, I don't know you guys that well, but much like a lot of CEOs, is polarizing. His strengths are his weaknesses. And I don't know a lot of CEOs that are very successful that are average across most characteristics. Most CEOs are slightly good crazy as opposed to bad crazy. And, and Ryan fits this mold. Well, I love Ryan. I think Ryan's amazing. But his strengths are his, his, his shadows and he is polarizing. Um, when I made the investment, there were 20,000 patients on the system. And he had built this amazing EMR as a SaaS model. And it wasn't growing very much, but it was better than some of the rest. And he says, I'm going to go free. I, I'm just going to make this thing free. And as it turns out with Obamacare, there was a subsidy kicking in at the exact same time that said, if you are willing to adopt electronic medical records, that um, you could claim up to a $40,000 reimbursement. And what was interesting here is that if you go from pad and paper to an EMR for free, you still can get a $40,000 reimbursement. And it turns out doctors are the most trailing edge risk averse guys you'll ever meet, which is kind of the DNA, but the combination of this $40,000 of free money, plus a belief that most of the doctors I talked to said, we, we, the last thing we want to do is, invest, is, is change everything to a, a system and have it be the loser and have to change again, that as it got any critical mass, people were like, well, it looks like this is going to be the winner. We're just going to go with it. And, and the data point that, we, that, that I found was that it was actually slightly growing virally, which is a doctor would upload a medical record, send it to another doctor, and that doctor would be like, I want to see the record. All I have to do is sign up for Practice Fusion. It was growing virally. And the last thing you would ever imagine is a kind of CRM system for doctors growing virally. So I love Ryan. I actually love that he is sort of extreme. 
because many of the best CEOs are extreme if they can get the right cult-like culture around him. And I actually think Practice Fusion is an embodiment of the CEO. And I often encourage entrepreneurs when they're joining companies, go spend the time with the CEO. I don't care if you're five degrees from them, that at most companies, even the giant companies like Larry Ellison and Bill Gates, but especially in a startup, is an embodiment of the culture. You gotta understand their values and what they're trying to build in the brand because they are the company. Ryan is the company and Practice Fusion is a cult-like culture. And that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. I think mediocrity or average in a startup is, is kind of a death blow. And so if you go to Practice Fusion, most people to join figure out really quickly if they like it or hate it. No one's just kind of okay working at Practice Fusion, but they're growing like crazy. You know, I think they're, they're five times the size of Kaiser in terms of medical records and, and they're growing, I think, about as large. They're going as fast as all the other EMRs put together right now, and they've raised a ton of money. And um, the truth of the matter is having a free electronic medical record that doctors are using hours and hours a day, there are so many different places you could monetize it every time you send out for a lab, every time you get a second opinion, every time that record moves around. There's just all these places you can monetize that. So I'm super excited about it. It's still early, but they're doing some amazing things. Anyone else? Anybody have a good story? The other way? <laughs> we could all talk to you personally and tell you some great stories. Yeah. Awesome. I, um, you know, I, I live in the peninsula and I work in the city, so I got about an hour commute each way. So I generally use it for office hours and call any entrepreneurs that I kind of like that has any questions about anything. So. Be careful what I ask for, you might get it. But if, if these kinds of questions, as you're trying to raise, you get stuck, I think I'm, and I try really hard to be responsive. Not, I mean, I can't always do everything, but I try to be pretty good. If you have questions or you have, if you have questions about you know, a term sheet or I'm thinking about raising and cater to your specific story, you know, or you want an opinion on a deck, like that's what I do all day long. I mean, and, and specifically my hour each way, instead of listening to KMBR with you know, some of my teams losing now, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to jump on a call and call people back and just give advice on stuff. I just like doing that, you know. Um, so, and all I ask in, ex in exchange is if you ever see great consumer companies with teams that are really early and are not, in, you know, if you're in the midst of a bidding war in a Series A, we're probably not going to win because, you know, we don't have the firepower of some of these giant mega super funds. But, you know, if, if there's a chance to build a relationship and be helpful along the way, I think that's. I actually think that's a lot of what this relationship should be, especially around the Series A. Because in the Series C, you don't have to give up control. So if you're not giving up control, I've seen some Series C lately that went awry. Because I, I, if you guys have experienced fundraising, there are things like cram down rounds and nasty ways to squeeze people out as you're recapitalizing. And, and, and it often happens in Chapter 7 when a company is doing really well and then has a bad chapter and has trouble fundraising. And there's kind of, you know, there are all these mechanisms like cram downs and, and recaps where, or pay to play rounds where nobody wants to put money in. But it's sort of a Mexican standoff and you can construct something that only if you put money in, you get a supersized share and everyone else gets squished to nothing, including ex-employees. That actually happens a lot. Um, I've seen a seed round two months after that seed round happened and loosely give a board seat to somebody go into a cram down situation within two months because they, they loosely gave a board seat to somebody that wasn't on the same page of the book. In this case, they were gonna do a deadline and then the person that put some money in said, don't do that deadline, I'm on the board, we'll fund it ourselves, we'll give you better economics. Dragged out those economics for three months and then decided, we don't wanna fund you and they couldn't get the deadline anymore. And so then they're saying, well, you kind of screwed me, bail us out. And they said, we'll do it, but we're going to do it for a third of the old round and all your other investors are going to get crammed out and all these things. I'm starting to see bad behavior sometimes, even early stage. And so that's where you still have to be careful of control. You know, something to look out for. Cool. But like I said, happy to help. Just send me great entrepreneurs early. That's all I ask for. Are you going to check out the demos at all? Sure. Yeah. Can I check out the demos? Yeah. Thank you. Love to. Hopefully there's something useful.